Good evening. I hope uh, you can uh, hear us. Uh, I'm happy to. Uh, my name is Cedric Cohen Scali. I'm teaching uh, history of Jewish philosophy at the University of Haifa, and I'm serving also as the director of the Busiris Center for the history for the research of the history and society of uh, German German history and German society. Um, today, uh, we want in this panel uh, to address the question of the future of democracy. Uh, I will open uh, my uh, the discussion uh, with uh, five remarks that I have uh, prepared. We convene tonight to address the question of the future of democracy. The first remark that I would like to make is that the future of democracy is far from being an evidence, a certitude, and that this future of democracy entails the possibility of the end of democracy, or rather the twilight of democracy. By this formula, uh, I mean its severe limitation at least in some geographic parts of the world, like Israel and the Middle East and North Africa, which struggle to establish or to maintain democratic institutions, but more often than not are faced with their destruction. This limitation of democracy is felt also in Europe, North and South America and India with the waves with the waves of populist nationalisms. This without mentioning imperial states like China and Russia, who resolutely refuse a democratic transition and engage in a global challenge of democracy as the military support of Putin to Bashar al-Assad has demonstrated in a frightful manner. After the waves of democratization in the late 20th centuries, century, it seems now that democracy has lost its global pretensions and expectations. Now I move to my second remark. I would like now to approach this twilight of democracy in the limited historical framework of Israel-Palestine. As described in Herzl, 1896 Judenstadt, political Zionism was clearly divided into two functions. Firstly, a new political and democratic organization of Jews. And secondly, a business undertaking for buying lands and, and in the colonization of Palestine. Herzl's a Zionist project was designed to articulate the politicization of the Jewish diaspora with a new rational exodus from Europe to Palestine. One finds here two central aspects of democracy, economic liberalism and political nationalism, which resonated strongly with his liberal conception of the British empire. The capacity of Zionism to articulate these two phases of 19th century liberalism in the building of a national economy and Jewish national democratic institution and parties is generally considered as the key for the Israeli victories of 1948 and 1967 over the Arab armies and the Palestinians organizations. Remark three. The technological and political superiority achieved by the Zionist national and democratic organization threatened the early modern mosaic of Ottoman Palestine and became rapidly an object of, of strong rejection and fear 
among Palestinian and Palestinian intellectuals. While many of them discovered in Zionism a national democratic model to be emulated and later overcome. Zionism and Palestinian nationalism developed in parallel a national democratic equation of ethnicity, land, religion, and culture within the national paradigms of Israel and Palestine. As a consequence, both Zionism and Palestinian nationalism actually remove from their national democratic concept and practice all possible political articulation with other ethnicities and religion, revealing a fatal lacuna in the national democratic project. This, this is now my fourth remark. This political incapacity of Middle Eastern democratic nationalisms, be it its, in its Zionist form or in different Arab declinations, to articulate the plurality of ethnic and religious community inherited from the Ottoman millet system, produced the Middle Eastern catastrophe of the 20th century with its series of ethnic and religious violence and oppression until today. This colossal failure is the background since 1967 for the rise of religious movements like religious Zionism, Sephardic and Ashkenazi Orthodox parties together with the galaxy of Islamic political organizations. In many ways, both Israel and most Arab states evolved toward, a mi toward mixed regimes, creating a balance between democratic nationalisms and a religious control over communities. These mixed regimes are a clear acknowledgement of the unsuccessful transition from religious and ethnic communities inherited from the Ottoman Empire to the nation states produced by democratic nationalism and their conflictualities. My fifth and last remark. I would like to conclude with a remark on the failure of the peace process in Israel-Palestine and uh, of, on the failure of the democratic movements of two, uh, 2011, often called the Arab Spring. The Oslo project relied on the assumption that it was possible to make a geographic, political and epistemological agreement between Jewish and Palestinian democratic nationalisms, while overlooking major flaws in their constitution, as well as their increasing challenge by religious movement. The conjunction of narratives was no remedy for the twilight of democratic nationalism in the Middle East. To the hopes of Oslo and of the 90s, succeeded the Second Intifada 9-11 and its series of wars and traumas. Increasing religious and illiberal trends in Israel politics and throughout the Middle East, for example, in the Turkey of Erdogan. When the democratic wave of 2011 rose in the Middle East, including Israel, it did not succeed to tip the balance between the old decaying nationalism and the rising religious and illiberal trends in politics. Democratic thinking and practice did not disappear as the recent movements against Netanyahu or against the failed communitarian Lebanon, Lebanese system were, has proven, yet democracy is under severe siege and control in the region for the next future. Thank you very much.
Should I continue? Or is Oliver? It's you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm Paula Deal. I'm a professor for political theory and um, history of ideas and political culture at the University of Kiel in the north of Germany. Um, I'm very glad to be here and thank you, Cedric. Uh, I, I really like your presentation. I think we have a lot of things to discuss today. Um, I would like to shift a little bit the focus of the debate towards um, the effects of right-wing populism on democracy and how they change the visions of the future of democracy. Um, my first remark will be, um, yeah, Cedric already mentioned that democracy is one uh, of the regimes that can destroy itself. Um, that's a possibility. And um, there are many ways to destroy itself. The one way to destroy democracy is to think about um, and to construct a vision of a future based on authoritarianism and um, and banish uh, human rights, for example. Um, another way to destroy democracy is to construct a vision of um, something that cannot change, uh, a way that has to be like it is without any um, possibility to have the people deciding or, or changing the way it is. That's the situation that uh, Pierre Savannah has called um, the blocked imaginary. So basically you have no resources for um, proposing visions of the future. Um, and one of the sentences or, or the, the phrases you always hear is uh, there is no alternative. That's the sentence that, that really focuses on the way that the imaginary is blocked and you cannot develop any further possibility to change the situation you are living on. Um, well, looking at populism, um, you see that populism always is, is an answer for a crisis of democracy and sometimes for the blocked imaginary. Populism mobilizes a lot of emotions and a lot of movements and it's, it's something that can be very positive for democracy. However, and that's my further remark, um, when populism meets right-wing extremist ideology, there is something going differently in the positive, the possible positive uh, influence of populism on, on the blocked imaginary. In this sense, the imaginary is not blocked anymore, but the, the visions of the future developed by right-wing uh, extremist ideologies are not democratic and are not proposed for the future. Actually, they, they look back before democracy or they look back before human rights and equality um, was taken uh, as a principle of uh, the new uh, society. And they develop a, a, a vision of a for the future where you have inequalities and you, when you have supremacy of some groups over others and they destroy democracy. Basically, you have these two ways to deal with that. And what is in interesting here is the ambivalences because once populism meets right-wing ideology or right-wing extremist ideology, you have both at the same time. You have um, a proposition of populism demanding more democracy on the one hand and dem demanding more power for the people. But at the same time, you have um, the construction of these people as something like a body, closed body that has to be defended against all foreigners or enemies of these bodies. And in this sense, you have a double, um, a, a double uh, uh, direction of the appeal and the description or the visions that they, they can build for democracy can be very ambivalent, sometimes contradictory. And I think that's something is what is uh, going on right now. If you look at right-wing populism uh, all over the world, um, looking at France, for example, you will see that uh, Marine Le Pen makes a very um, critical discourse on capitalist society. But in the end, she develops a kind of, she draws a, a vision of democracy, which is not democratic anymore, because the solution for the problems posed by capitalism is not a democratic solution, but 
just okay let let's put out all the foreigners and our problem will, will be solved so you have a shift of uh what is going on here um and um, the, what I want to say at the end of my uh, of my brief comments is we need to pay attention exactly where this shift takes place, because I think that's the more interesting part where you have a kind of um, searching for answers uh, for the against this background of the blocked imaginary on the one hand, and you have the potential for a, a kind of democratic vision of the future. And at the same time, you have a shift in the answers you are giving from democracy to anti-democracy. And I will finish with that. Thank you very much. Well, um, I think it's my turn now. Uh, my name is Oliver Machert. I'm uh, teaching political theory at the University of Vienna. Um, and um, I'm glad to be here and I'm very happy that I was invited. Uh, I would like in the very few minutes I have, I would like to um, basically take up uh, uh, what Paula said just uh, a few minutes ago about this um, starting point uh, for our discussion, which I think is really the starting point. It's this uh, about three decades of neoliberal dominance and I'm I really would like to say propaganda that there are no alternatives in this famous uh, quote by uh, Margaret Thatcher there is no alternative um, and so we have been told for many decades now that there is no alternative to um, a whole set of policies austerity cutting off social secu security and so on um, that we came to a point where large sectors of the population, at least in the West, uh, large sectors of the population think that the only promise the future holds is one of worsening living conditions. So you don't have any positive image of the future anymore. What you were for many decades after the Second World War, uh, this glorious years of uh, of um, uh, the social of, of uh, the welfare state, uh, everybody thought that and in the West, everybody thought that their subsequent generations, their children, will have a better life. Now people think their children will have a life worse than their own. Uh, so what got lost was a sense of today or future in a positive sense. And why? Because there is because um, there was a loss of concrete alternatives um, and uh, utopian visions of what how a better life could look like. So here we are, and uh, that is the problem. Now it has become increasingly difficult to imagine the future of democracy as something other than the mere extension of the status quo. Uh, and so we think of the future as something which is as bad as the present, if not worse. But what can we do about this? Uh, obviously, it does not suffice to defend existing democratic achievements. That would be the, the liberal approach, for instance, against the danger of right-wing populism, just to defend the status quo. Obviously, the defense of the status quo does not produce a sense of positive, of a democratic future, of a positive futurity. So instead of doing this, uh, we need to broaden the horizon of imagination to take up what, uh, what Paula just said. We have to broaden the horizon of imagination, our ways of thinking about democratic possibilities, by exploring ways to deepen democracy and to expand democracy. We need to find democratic alternatives to a status quo, which is perhaps less than democratic. And one way of calling that project um, of expanding uh, democracy is radical democracy. Some call it participa participatory democracy. I prefer the term radical democracy. 
simply uh, for the reason that it points to the necessity of radicalizing democracy, of expanding democracy, of deepening democracy. Uh, and this involves criticizing the minimal institutional model of Western liberal democracy and expanding democratic principles into areas of daily life, of work, of education, of leisure, of the home. So it's the democratization of the whole society. What does this require? I, four very short points. First, I think such a project of radicalizing democracy, or as some theorists call it, democratizing democracy, involves an enlarged notion of politics, not simply the political system, not political parties only, but it involves social movements, it involves a politics of everyday life. Second, uh, this enlarged notion of politics involves uh, a view of society as an area of conflicts. So it will not work if we think of it simply as a matter of social engineering, as a technical question, as a matter of expertise, just ask the experts. We need to engage in a conflict over the democratization of society simply because there are very powerful forces which are against it. So it needs you know, an engagement in a conflictual practice of deepening, um, of deepening democracy. Third, uh, by recognizing the ever-present possibility of conflict, uh, we are also engaging and demonstrating the contingent nature of social and political relations as they are, the contingent nature of the status quo. What is contingent? Simply what could be otherwise. So by engaging with the status quo, by engaging in a conflict over the status quo, we are in fact demonstrating that there are alternatives, that things could be otherwise. So a, demo a politics of radicalizing democracy points precisely to the possibility of another future uh, or a democratic future, a more democratic for future. And fourth, uh, this proposal to deepen democracy is important uh, or can only be engaged with by demonstrating that the future is here in the here and now. And this is my last point, because this is something which you find in philosophy. For instance, in Jacques Derrida's famous little bit outworn phrase of uh, the democracy to come, la démocratie à venir, uh, uh, which means that what we have now is not really democracy yet, but on the other hand, doesn't mean that there will be full-blown democracy at some distant point in the future, but it means that democracy is something which is always to come, and precisely because it can never be reached, and we nonetheless try to make it present, we have to produce it in the here and now. So that's his point. And this point is consistent with actual practices of uh, political activism, especially with the idea of prefiguration, which was very prominent, already prominent in the anarchist tradition of the 19th century, then very prominent in the civil rights movement, which became again prominent in uh, the occupations in 2011, which is the idea, prefiguration, which is the idea precisely that we cannot simply wait for a future moment of full-blown democracy, but democracy must be present in the means, not only in the ends. So by working for a more democratic society, we have to work for it in a democratic way. And by working for it in a democratic way, we realize democracy in the very moment we work for it to come. This is exactly the same idea as Derrida's idea. They have not necessarily read Derrida, but it is something which came out of, uh, of uh, political practice. And I think it is a very important point to keep in mind that by, as democratic activists, as it were, uh, we are always engaging in what I would like to call a time loop. We are always bending linear time. 
bending the future into the present through our democratic activities. That is, we doesn't need to wait for a democratic future. We need to work for it democratically, thereby pro producing it, but not in the, at a future point, but in the here and now. So it's already here, as long as we uh, act democratically. So I, I guess this, I, my time is up um, and I hand over to Jan. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Jan Sova. Uh, by formation and profession activity, I'm mainly sociologist with some background in psychology and cultural studies. I currently work at the uh, Chair of Cultural Theory at the Academy of uh, Fine Arts in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, usually the person who speaks the last has got it the most difficult because uh, a lot has been said. However, I'm in a very luxurious uh, condition of being able to build upon what was said uh, before. And I totally applaud, as you saw, the reactions that I, the emotes that I pr produced on the screen. I totally applaud to what has been uh, said uh, so far. And uh, I would like to maybe complement and a little bit ex extend both criticism and the vision for possible alternative uh, future. Uh, let me start with an empirical example of the situation that I'm witnessing in the country where I live, which is Poland. Uh, you may know it that Poland is in the middle of a right-wing turn, right? Some people say it's a populism, right-wing populism, conservative populism. I, I don't want to explore these uh, labels too much. Uh, it, it's obvious that there is a, a right-wing conservative uh, turn. It had its culmination last year in autumn with the change of the abortion law when uh, 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 access to abortion was made more difficult, uh, now women are supposed to give birth in Poland even to fetuses who have fatal damage and we know that they would not uh, live. So this uh, uh, one of three reasons why abortion was possible before, now it's uh, uh, cancelled. Uh, you may also know that it provoked uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, public unrest, demonstrations, manifestations on the street and lots of uh, resistance. And you see, it's not surprising because actually when you look at the uh, social research and opinion polls, uh, only 13, one, three, 13 percent of Polish population approves of this change. So uh, not only uh, it does not have a support of majority, it does not have a support of plurality. It's, it's the most minoritarian position within Polish, uh, uh, Polish society. There is quite of uh, research done both internationally and in Poland. There is uh, American sociologist Ronald Ingelhardt who runs what is called World Sylvia of Values. Every couple of years they do research around the world to see how values, ways of lives and norms are changing around the world. Poland is included in this research. Polish sociologists like Miroslav Majody has been doing similar research. We have opinion polls. And you can see in the last two de decades, a uh, secular, stable uh, uh, evolution towards more open and more liberal positions within Polish, uh, uh, Polish society. Now, when you take most of the controversial political issues like women's rights, gay marriage, European integration, the place of religion within the, the, the state, should religion be taught at school, should church be uh, subsidized in any way, etc., etc., uh, at least plurality, which means the biggest group, in some cases the majority of Polish society, is in favor of more open, progressive, liberal solutions. Political life went in exactly the opposite direction. Political life, especially in the last decade, has become more conservative, more closed, more uh, in favor of this uh, regressive and not progressive uh, 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 solutions. So uh, I think this may be a starting point for a lot of uh, uh, interesting reflection. However, it proves that uh, political development in Poland has not been democratic in the sense of translating opinion of majority, the will of majority, uh, uh, majority values into legislation. Uh, we have seen exactly the opposite. Now, when you look at the uh, evolution and establishment of uh, modern parliamentarism, by modern, I mean modern to, to distinguish it from medieval parliamentarism, uh, you can see that this is not a glitch. It's not a kind of a random mistake within the system. It's more a result of some decisions that were made in the foundational period of uh, uh, modern parliamentarism. When you look at the very interesting discussions among, among uh, founding fathers of the American Republic that happened on the, uh, uh, the, the, in the journal The Federalist, you may 
find it online and, and, and read it, uh, they insist that what they want is not democracy. What they want is republic. And they say democracy is rule of the people, rule of majority, uh, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Republic is the rule of the representatives. Now, they may rule according to the will of majority, but they have freedom also to do whatever else they, uh, they want. This is the key institution of contemporary uh, uh, parliamentarism, which, which is free mandate, uh, as opposed to imperative mandate. Imperative mandate is you choose your representative, and this representative is obliged to uh, uh, represent your position. If they fail to do it, you are in some cases, uh, or in most cases in the imperative mandate, you are allowed to recall your representatives. A uh, free mandate that was actually enshrined in the first constitutions, the uh, uh, French constitution, the American constitution, free mandate is clear. Uh, the representative does not represent any constituency, any group, any assembly. They represent the nation as in general. And they are not uh, limited by any sort of uh, 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 instructions, any sort of uh, uh, you know limitations that may be imposed uh, uh, upon them. Uh, there, there, there was uh, some you know also interesting uh, 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 reasoning behind uh, uh, that uh, uh, solution that also said you know we cannot allow too much democracy because people are too emotional, not educated enough. Uh, they will make decisions that would harm people. They need a sort of a paternalistic power over them that would uh, look after them in their own interest. It's, 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 it's a kind of pastoral knowledge, uh, pastoral, sorry, pastoral power in the sense that Foucault he, he, he employed this, uh, the, the, this term, right? Uh, the result, uh, is uh, that, you know, when you look at the history and the, 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 the contemporary state of parliamentary democracies, very rarely it's the rule of majority or the rule of majoritarian opinion. In most cases, parliamentarism is the rule of the best organized and the most determined minority that finds its ways through, uh, mostly through uh, 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 the processes of hegemonic processes of the public sphere, by influencing uh, the, the, the discussion, by influencing the, the discourse, by being the demagogues. Actually, this is what the, the Greek theory of democracy already recognized. Greek, uh, uh, Greeks knew that uh, uh, elections were a possibility. However, they deliberately renounced that. They said, we don't want to have elections. We want to choose our representatives by lot. Because if we have elections, elections open the stage for demagogues. So people who are well-spoken, rich, and they uh, look well, will always win with people who do not know how to speak well, are poor and bad looking. And merits uh, 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 actually uh, are not so important. What is more important is your uh, ability to shape the, the, the discourse, to, 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 to shape the hegemonic discourse, as we, as we would say uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in, in more contemporary terms. So I believe this crisis of representation is in the very center of the problem we have with, uh, with democracy. Because actually, when you look at the how populists question constitutional order, their problem with, uh, I agree with what uh, Pola said, that in many cases, they would like to rewind the tape and go back to what was before democracy. However, I, I believe that it's more ambivalent. They are surely against liberal democracy, which is the rule of abstract law, the division of powers, and uh, this kind of institutionalization of, of democracy within what Oliver called this, this institutional minimum of liberal uh, democracy. However, I believe that there is also some sort of democratic sentiment in, in, in populism. Uh, democratic in a, in a sense of uh, let's make public discourse more equal. Let's allow people who were, for various reasons, material or symbolic, excluded from access to the public discourse, let's allow them to, to speak. This is the reason why social media played such a huge role in development of populism, because social media smashed what was called the Overton, what is called the Overton window, which is the window of the common sense where only, you know, you have few outlets, private or public, and only what is uh, uh, shared as, as, as uh, conforming to the common sense may get articulated. With uh, 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 social media, the extremes can recognize themselves and talk to themselves outside of the window of the official uh, uh, dominant or hegemonic, whatever you want to call it, uh, public discourse, right? So I believe that there is a, I do not totally agree with the solutions. I believe that they provide, that they, they provide bad answers, however, to 
rightful and uh, uh, quite pertinent questions or doubts around the state of, of uh, uh, representation, right? So, uh, what, 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 is the, what is the way out? I totally agree with what uh, uh, Oliver said, that uh, we have to find democratic alternatives to the uh, liberal democratic status quo. Uh, uh, to, to be uh, completely uh, uh, open and precise, I agree that historically, uh, parliamentary democracy was progressive with compared with uh, uh, monarchy and and you know the remains of the feudal order that uh, that that somehow survived also the 18th century and 19th century and you know when you took a women's suffrage question all the way until even 20th century in switzerland there is a canton where women could not vote until 1991 in local elections 1991 this is all, all of us here were already born at that stage right so uh, uh, obviously Parliamentary democracy was progressive. However, uh, uh, I believe we need to look at society and at politics historically. So no solution is uh, progressive forever. And actually now, uh, uh, parliamentary representation is more of a problem than a solution. I believe that, uh, uh, and also what, uh, for, for instance, you know, Cambridge Analytica scandal showed up, uh, representation and the public discourse has been, they have been completely hijacked and uh, they, they, they it's more problems than, than solutions nowadays. So uh, what kind of democratic alternatives we, we can have? Uh, what, uh, what Oliver mentioned, radical democracy and extension of democracy to new areas, spheres or arenas where democracy was not present, like the workplace or uh, private life, etc. This is totally important. I totally, uh, I totally agree. However, I think we should also work with the, uh, uh, the very dem the political form of democracy. Which is uh, uh, which is parliamentary uh, representation? We need we need to look for uh, other ways, and I believe that there are two basically uh, uh, two things. Uh, one is reforming the mandate, so uh, the constituency would have more control over representatives. Absolutely, I'm not in favor of restituting you know imperative mandate the way it was. I don't know in the Middle Ages. It's more it's more to think about it as as the French uh, uh, sorry Italian uh, political philosopher Mass Massimiliano Tomba argues. It's taking imperative uh, mandate as a model of possible transformation. So we 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 the, the, the idea that we should have more control over who we elect, and another thing more procedural is I totally believe in lotocracy or demarchy. Right, which I think that representatives should be rather uh, chosen by lot, randomized, than elected. And I believe that randomization should play a much bigger role on various levels in our political process. If you want a concrete example, and this is my last point, also to show, as Oliver argued, that the future is already here, when you look at the practice of citizen assemblies, for example, Ireland. Ireland reformed, and also to loop what I said with the at the beginning, Ireland recently reformed its abortion law and its marriage law uh, to make it more open and liberal. This was one of the last European countries that had very strict regulations regarding uh, uh, civil unions, uh, gay marriage, what's called gay marriage and abortion. This process precisely went through citizen panels. So you choose a group of about 100 people randomly from population, the way we social scientists choose the group we research when we want to do social research, so we, we, we randomize. Then these people, there is also a very important deliberative element. These people meet and they have to talk and they have to find a solution. Then uh, after this process, they propose some uh, uh, legislation that is later put to national vote, like in a referendum. This is exactly the way it happened in Ireland. And actually it's very interesting that the deliberative result of this citizen panel in Ireland concerning abortion, like, you know, how many people were in favor against what was the final shape was very, very close to the opinion that was uh, 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 articulated in the referendum. So this problem, you know, that the political process and the social life go in opposite directions, it is somehow addressed and they, they, are, they, they converge uh, more. Now we have idea to employ this, uh, and it has already been done in other spheres, for example, climate policy, even, you know, Emmanuel Macron, who is by no way a kind of, you know, a radical anarchist is in favor of that. So I believe that slowly these ideas are uh, penetrating the mainstream, and I believe they provide some kind of hope or a ray of light towards po possible future uh, uh, reforms of, uh, of democracy. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for all. Uh, I have received a first question that I will read. Uh, 
The debate is very interesting. You all seem to agree that democracy is in, is in need of a future which is opposed to a blocked imaginary neoliberal post-democracy. Uh, on, the, on the one end, and imagination, imagination going gaga post-truth populism on the other. But why, why is it so difficult to develop a positive and concrete vision of the future? It seems very difficult to convince people that building a positive democratic future is possible. Is that because we are facing pro problem we cannot solve? Migration, climate sense, and so on. That's the questions. Uh, so uh, I guess, uh, Paula, you 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 have to in some way uh, begin. Yeah, I can go for it. Um, it's a quite difficult answer because it's very hard to be positive. I'm trying to be positive right right now. <clears throat> Actually, um, the problem here is um, mainful, but uh, one of these problems is that uh, the national states already <clears throat> gave a lot of power to other institutions. Um, they made decisions how to regulate a distribution of resources and how to operate uh, regarding uh, major decisions in the, in the state. Um, which transferred from the state to companies. Um, <clears throat> just to give an, an example, we are having a huge debate right now about, about public sphere in social media. Um, so is it, is, it, is it right that Mark Zuckerberg can banish people from, from using Facebook? Is it, is it a good thing? I mean, everybody is now, now, now seems to agree that it's a good thing because he's banishing Donald Trump from, from using uh, Facebook and Twitter did it also. But um, the problem behind is that you have, even the public sphere um, is conceived as a private space, as a club. You go into a club and there is someone taking care of this club that can decide how the rules are. You cannot make this person accountable. And um, that's very concrete. You have a lot of other decisions made concerning trades, concerning uh, working legislations and so on. And in a certain way, um, the instance that you can render accountable by the people is the government. But if the government gave power away, you have no one to make accountable. So that, that's one of the problems uh, that we are dealing right now. Then there are a lot of decisions uh, about the way we are living that are not taken very seriously. Climate change, migration, the res resources that we have. Um, we know that you don't have enough resource to continue living in, in a in a way that we are expanding uh, economy. Uh, you don't have the natural and the human resources for expand the economy forever, but you continue thinking about economy as something that has to grow. Um, these are basic structural problems. And um, the problem that, that we see here is that populism is reacting to it, uh, but uh, nobody knows exactly how to take back control of this decisions that what was made before. So who can decide right now in the name of a people? Um, and, and if you look at the debate in the Brexit uh, debate, the, 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 the idea to take back control is exactly that. You had the concrete enemy, which was Europe. Uh, it's not resolving the problem uh, to, to going out from Europe, but um, it's a kind of reaction to this situation where you don't know who is accountable for the rules we are, we are obeying every day. Um, and I guess there is, there is a potential here uh, for changing, uh, but the problem of populism is that it's not really precise. You always have another ideology. And just to comment on what Jan said, um, 
the populism I see as a potential and also an ambivalent uh, movement. But when it comes together with right wing extremist ideology, then it destroys um, democracy, as you have in many countries in Europe and abroad the world. So, uh, Oliver, you want to pick on on that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, this was a very important question, obviously. Um, but to bring it into the loop, as it were, as and continue what Paula said and also what Jan said, is that what is puzzling is that discrepancy Jan described between popular sentiment, say, on abortion, which is more democratic, as it were, as actual politics policies of uh, the the parties in power uh, which is uh, puzzling not only in that case it's puzzling also that you have for instance during the decades of neoliberal so-called reforms you had constant in the polls uh, in the surveys you had uh, a constant support for the welfare state as it is you know overwhelmingly people want the welfare state during the time where it was in the media, uh, there was a total propaganda war was going on against the welfare state. Uh, and also all the political parties of the whole spectrum uh, joined the neoliberal uh, choir. So uh, obviously there is a huge discrepancy between that popular sentiment and politics. And usually we are presented this very, very strange image that the political elite is more enlightened than the people you know and the people are reactionary and the elite is enlightened and obviously that's nonsense uh that doesn't mean that everything everybody thinks is right you know uh so the, the popular sentiment is not always enlightened nor is the political elite always dumb and reactionary but there is definite this is definitely uh um uh, a myth uh, a, a liberal myth and so what to do? And I mean, of course, uh, this is a political question. And I think that political problems can only be addressed politically. There are only political solutions to political problems. And this is a political problem. So what we need is a political force that addresses the, the, the real problems, uh, uh, social problems and so on. And at the same time, reactivates the democratic and emancipatory sentiments, popular sentiments. And the name for that could be left populism, a left version of populism, because what the right version of populism does is addressing the reactionary sentiments, the, you know, the racist sentiments and so on, the nationalist sentiments. But why not addressing, you know, the emancipatory sentiments, not only through deliberation, that's perfectly fine, but also through a political force that, that brings forth um, uh, a program and a project of radicalizing uh, these democratic aspects. And the second thing I would like to say is, um, it's interesting that this happens to some degree also uh, in a totally perverted way uh, with, uh, with right-wing populism. Uh, what you mentioned, Paula, this, this slogan, take back control, right, is a perverted version of a deeply democratic slogan because the people are not in control obviously and to, and when when you have a political force saying take back control for the people that could be you know done in an entirely reactionary way you know by a right wing form of populism but it could be done in an entirely democratic way and and totally legitimate way to say let's take back control why not you know i mean this is uh, how how you're going to establish something like a democratic future if you don't work for it politically so my point would be that what need what needs to be done is a shift in the general sentiment in the shift in political hegemony in this form of thinking about the world politically and you need and for that you need uh, political forces that do this because it's not going to be as I said uh, it's not going to be a techno technocratic solution it's not going to be um, a mere solution which takes place within the field of existing political forces 
but then something needs to be done, you know. So the only so my answer to the question would be that we need a political answer to that problem. The future has to be the democratic future has to be established politically. It's not enough to wait for it. I, I want to add something about uh, what uh, Oliver said. Um, so uh, you 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 proposed and uh, um, a populism of the left. Um, uh, I I I believe that uh, there is a. A running uh, assumption, especially between uh, you and, and, and maybe uh, Jan, that uh, we could build a democratic future upon uh, um, the uh, uh, the pace uh, uh, overcoming our um, uh, uh, burial of uh, earlier democratic uh, institution inherited from a long tradition uh, republican liberal and socialist uh, i believe that this is one of the major problem and not one of the major solutions uh, the this uh, direct communication uh, of the power with the people or the people within themselves uh, and the idea that you can just bypass uh, 200 or 300 years of uh, democratic uh, construction is a major question. Uh, I, I am not in favor of a populism of the left. I believe uh, that uh, our uh, democratic history is rich in uh, uh, people, uh, in personality, in formulas that we can revisit and use and that many of our institutions uh, were founded. You, you mentioned, for example, uh, the welfare state. Uh, welfare state is surely not something populist uh, and was uh, constructed within mixing the history of uh, the socialist movements and uh, the administration, development of administration. I don't see how populism, especially we see it in uh, South America, uh, is responding to these challenges. I believe that here. I am proposing more uh, a re-embracing of our tradition in a in a, in a, in a more engaging way than just putting it away. Can I maybe uh, comment as you uh, sort of like I feel uh, interpolated in a way? I mean, I don't want to speak for uh, Oliver, but. Uh, 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 personally, I would not agree with, because you use this term burial of the, of the older forms of democracy. I don't think about it as a burial. I would rather say a constant reinvention. Because you see all this, when you look at modern parliamentarism that established itself in 18th and 19th century, that was an invention, right? They sometimes use the word republic referring to Rome or uh, democracy referring to Greece, but these were inventions these were like new institutions that were somehow based obviously you can you can show a transition from uh, a medieval parliamentarism and all this you know uh, uh, aristocrats gather around the king and these councils and, and uh, no taxation without representation this is the rule from magna carta so 13th century i i i would not say burial i would say uh, advancing sometimes dialectically overcoming, sometimes reinventing, uh, because if there is anything like, you know, the essence of democracy, I don't think it's in, in given institutional solutions. I think the essence of democracy is the constant erasure between the ruled and the ruling. And in various historical moments, this erasure may take various institutional forms. So this is what I meant when I said that uh, parliamentarism, modern parliamentarism was progressive. 
when confronted with uh, feudalism and monarchy. At that time, this erasure took form of the, the parliamentary uh, uh, democracy. But now we need to erase it again, because just as Paula said, uh, the uh, current political mechanisms are uh, uh, captured or rather profit certain groups of interest who find the ways to bend them like lobby groups, you know, uh, political parties, etc., etc. So uh, uh, I don't know, but very briefly also about populism. Oliver surely will say uh, more about it. I mean, knowing his books, I, I, I suppose this is going to be a, a, his subject. But you know, uh, uh, it, I, 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 it depends what you mean by populism, because uh, populism is such a hugely ambivalent word. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, I, I don't know. I'm not so attached to the love. I think left-wing populism. Well, fair enough. It may go. I mean, depends on the content of the of, of the solution. Why not? I don't know if you have more questions, uh, Cedric. I have no more questions. Many thanks for the interesting statements. I definitely agree with the idea that conflict bound to a plurality of position belongs to democracy. But what does a democratic uh, culture of conflicts look like? Not uh, any conflict, not any way of resolving conflict seem adequate for democracy to come. <laughs> so it's a comment and a, and, and a question. Um, maybe I... I could come back to two things that um, uh, you stress uh, and also uh, Oliver and Jan in very different positions concerning the role of, um, of populism in, uh, in being an emancipatory factor. Um, I think when um, right-wing populists uh, scream, take back control, uh, they are thinking about something different than um, left-wing populism, although both are, ex are, 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 are expressing the problem of democracy, which is the promise to have people on power. Uh, and you can never have the people completely on power in, in our mass democracy. You can only have degrees of power in power and of the people. And that's a huge problem. And um, I mean, Oliver, you, was, you were very positive in seeing uh, democracy as being doing every day and in doing it, we are becoming democratic. But there is a flip side of it. Um, you are doing and doing, and you are always thinking about something that should be and that carries a lot of frustration. I don't want to be so negative here. I'm just trying to figure out where, where are the, the constraints here. Um, and at this time, when things start to go wrong, you have a huge problem. And, but I, I will not say that populism cannot be emancipatory. You see that in some situations, especially when it's co connected to a um, 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 a radical democratic vision of the future, you, in, in this, to use these terms, um, you have a project of emancipation. Um, but then you look at the concrete um, cases. I'm, I'm thinking about Chavez in Venezuela, for example. Oh, we are, we are running time. So that's ambivalent. <laughs> that's <Next> all. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. A very interesting thanks. discussion. It never ends, I think, but just like the political process never ends. Which Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much.